Call the Board of Supervisors in the session for the 8.30 work session with our County Engineer, Russell Weber. Russ. Good morning. Um, uh, I guess I'll just leave it up to you. Um, if you want to go over, we'll just go over the, um, the engineer's report real quickly. Yes. Okay, so the North Bankston Road Bridge, Taylor Construction is planning to start that work after the completion of the Hickory Valley Bridge. Hickory Valley Bridge is currently under construction. Taylor has uh, started the substructure work. Taylor will continue the substructure work for the next few weeks. Goose Hill Road, the prime contractor for the progressive <coughs> structures has most of the Precast reinforced concrete boxes installed at the two sites. They're just missing the end sections. And then they look to place that third location this week. Thunder Road, uh, Taylor is complete with the construction of the final box culvert. Stager will be on site this week to backfill and complete the remaining crossroad culverts. River City has started the HMA overlay on the east half, um, and they'll look to come back in once Stager is complete with the culvert work to finish that overlay. James and Flanagan, Keeter plans to start next or on Monday for the culvert work. HMA overlay will will follow. 22 miscellaneous culvert replacement. Keeter will work those in probably after uh, he gets done with the James and Flanagan culverts. The Hamran Bridge is currently under construction. Uh, Jim Schrader has completed the substructure work minus um, one culvert, or abutment rather, uh, to be poured. And he will continue that work and then move to the superstructure within the next couple weeks. The John Deere project, uh, the John Deere aspect of it, John Deere Road, Pierce Tobin uh, continues grading and storm sewer for the South Roundabout and sections of the South John Deere uh, Road. This work will continue over the next few weeks. Portson has started paving sections of the South Roundabout at Peru and will continue to do so over the next few weeks. As far as the arterials uh, section goes, the phase two is complete with the intersection improvements and phase three is underway. They are, uh, they milled the, last week they milled from Asbury to Pennsylvania and River City is expected to come in this week to do some HMA overlay. And then uh, in front of you is the substantially complete projects of Old Farley and Rockville Road, Old Massey Road, Sundown Road, and Habercorn Road. Put a few more on the list, so that's good. Have any questions? I don't have anything here. Is it looking like we're good to get everything completed? Looks like it's been a really great construction season and we had an aggressive agenda. Yeah, we did have a very aggressive agenda. Um, the spring was a little slow. Um, but we are making progress, uh, but it's still the expectation to get that over all the overlays completed. So trivia question, the Northwest arterial, is that going to have, I mean, obviously I'm living with the milling, which is great. The progress there is tremendous, but um, what are they going to put down? Is that a concrete or an asphalt overlay? You know what that's going to be? Asphalt. Okay. That's what I said, but no, I wanted to check yeah. with the professional. <laughs> In case I need to go back and correct something. And I'm getting um, compliments from people really close to me, my father-in-law and um, stepmother about the Sundown Road and Humkey. Wow, is that safe? We've driven through there. That's a big difference. They've brought that down and they feel that they would have had issues just in this past couple of months if that road wasn't already, had already been completed just with some close calls. So Tremendous safety improvement there. Yeah, there. good. Good to hear those comments. <laughs> yeah, and there are people who let me know. <laughs> good, I'd like to hear that. 
So then from there, we can probably shift gears to the administrative road maintenance superintendent. Guys, I sent out a memo last week, just kind of a summarization of it. Um, be happy to read it out loud or we can kind of just dive in um, any questions, but the intent of this was to have a assistant roads maintenance superintendent to backfill the crew, current crew leader position. The crew leader uh, individual is set to retire in November. So it was an opportunity to, to look at the position and reevaluate um, our, our needs there. Um, so putting in more content in the job description as effectively acting as the road maintenance superintendent in his or her absence and uh, management duties uh, running out of the Farley shop to assist with maintenance projects and winter snow removal. Uh, crew leader is a bargaining unit position. The assistant roads maintenance superintendent would be a management duty or a management position given the duties stated. Does Pat currently work as a crew leader? Yes. So <clears throat> probably more accurately reflects some of the work that Pat's been doing. Um, it, in, in a way, I think it, it was good. Um, he's, he's filled that role well. Um, it was, like I said, it was just with his retirement, it was kind of nice to evaluate it. And we feel like this position would be better served as a management position. Um, I think he agrees, and this is this kind of stems back to Anthony and Don days. Um, this was always uh, in the discussion for when this would, were to happen. So we're just kind of carrying that out, um, given the timing of, of the retirement. But clearly, you feel it's an improvement. I mean, you want to go forward. It's not just Don and Anthony. Right, I agree, one hundred percent. So I was informed. Uh, earlier on yeah. un, under the Anthony and Don days um, and it's just kind of I agree and I just fully want to execute it. I see that Supervisor Wickham has on the his insight into these is usually pretty good. I was just asking. Good morning. You, here we are. Good morning. Good it would morning, be good Jay. to have his input I think. Good morning Jay. Good morning. Good morning Russell. Good morning all. Um, yeah, maybe lay out the position a little bit more and the changes you're specifically looking for, Russell. I, you know, I've met with Pat a few times and generally know what he does, but uh, tell me a little bit about the changes you're trying to uh, offer us. Okay. Yeah. Um, kind of the wording under the job description of, of the direct and direct supervision and management is being exercised over the maintenance employees and also effectively acting as the maintenance superintendent in his or her absence. The, the use of good judgment in a management role and assigning and completing tasks of the maintenance projects, as well as the uh, winter snow removal, and directing and coordinating staff to complete said tasks under, under a management is, it was the, a crucial part of that as well, Jay. Okay. So is, is Pat currently a member of the union? I believe so. Yeah. And so this would be a change related to, to that structure and you're looking to uh, shore up or increase your management uh, oversight uh, for this position. Is that uh, a fair assessment? That, that is fair. And then this would primarily be over the Farley shop and have a management present over the 10 individuals over in the Farley shop. And also big one with the snow removal, you know, those 3 a.m. calls and checking roads um, would better fit the western half of the county and, and our problem roads and assessing that. Well, one of the issues we, and so is this position designed as salaried position? This is going to be an hourly. Okay. 
So similar to what we did with Chad. So right. taking him from uh, a salary position to an hourly position, we feel it's just more fair and equitable and a better way to track his time just due to the things you mentioned, uh, 3 a.m. snow removal and calling in the snow plows and other things. So, okay. Um, yeah, I generally understand. I'm certainly not ready to take action today. I'd like to, to sit on some of the information and to certainly have some more discussion at the board, but uh, at least I'm abreast of the situation. Okay. Um, Do we have it on for a resolution today? I believe so. And, and I'm, I am not disagreeing with Supervisor Wickham about, you know, to, to move it forward, but was there a reason that you needed to take action today? <clears throat> Just um, to be aware of time? Yeah, it, it's a timing thing. We wanted a little bit of overlap with uh, Pat and his knowledge and experience to kind of help um, shape or mold or transfer knowledge on, on his role and what he did and then build on that. And also we have snow removal, um, snow removal meeting coming up. And so this would affect the snow routes and what individual um, that would take this role. So it, in, in a way, kind of, it would help the sooner the better, but I understand. But <clears throat> I guess here's the, so Supervisor Wickham is obviously with us, but not present in the room. Next week, we will not have Chair Potoff present. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the board meetings will continue, but um, I don't know, maybe you can, if you have an opinion at this time, I don't want to delay taking action. I don't disagree that maybe it's not a today decision, but I I don't want the, us to be in the way of this a necessary, if we're going to have consensus about this, we want to make sure that we're obviously good with Russell's timeline too. I would be in favor of moving forward with it. Uh, obviously, Pat has filled the role very well, mm -hmm. but lacking the ability to be a supervisor to, I guess, direct the workforce. Yeah, they can listen to him, but. Sometimes they don't. There's not a whole lot he can do other than go to up the ladder to try to get you know disciplinary action taken. I think. Right. So it definitely needs uh, to be addressed. Uh, but I would be in favor of it. Is this a position? One of the go ahead, Jay. Uh, Russell, I didn't see in your document. Is there any? Is there any uh, budget considerations or changes with this move? Um, it, it, it is budgeted for Jay. Um, the, um, I did evaluate the salary based on similar roles um, with uh, our partner counties, the top 10, um, evaluating maintenance and general roadway budgets and our miles and taking in consideration both aspects and and then the uh, comparing the wage to the uh, similar counties and the comparables. Um, I guess one of my questions would be, what what is the change in budget? What is the most likely increase we're looking at? The wage increase, Jay? Yes. Okay. It's it'll um, currently the crew leader position is at twenty eight eighty four at step five, or I guess it would be three, sorry. And then um, this management uh, uh, top step five would be 3328. Mm -hmm. Roughly, probably be close to $10,000. A top pay would be about $10,000 different, roughly $5 an hour. When Russell, and maybe it's in your resolution, I didn't look at it, but are any of those numbers in the resolution? They're they're not in the document I have in front of me. No, I didn't. I didn't okay. ask them. Um, yeah, I, I think that's I, crucial I, on on any piece, any proposals you have that are significant in anything. Certainly, when you're talking about a few thousand bucks up to ten were ten grand, I'd like to have that in the resolution and, and or the work session document. 
the uh, new scale is at the end of the documents, but right. the, the old just, scale. Is just not the justification on, on where I came up with the numbers wasn't. I, I actually agree with Supervisor Wickham on this too, though, that when we're making a change, we just want to see the budget impact. It isn't a, it, it's, it is just part of the overall evaluation. So if we hired someone in here at step four, based on who, whatever the credentials are, it will have a budget impact because obviously we're paying more in wages, more in benefits. So just looking ahead around that corner, it's it, that's, I guess, the piece that's probably missing here. I didn't see it. it. Yes, the wage scale is here, but what does it do to your overall departmental budget? Maybe maybe there won't be that much of a difference because you know the current employee is, is at maybe the top of the current wage scale and whoever you may be hiring will come in similar in terms of hourly wage. Do you have any questions, Russell, about you know what we're thinking? No, I can for, I, I have a printout of the document. Um, I can simply pass it along and if you want to put it on and for next week or want any clarification, um, be happy to do so. But even coordinating with Stella Rundy, the budget yep. director should be and she's to... a, she's aware. Right. Um, and we're just missing, I guess, that, that piece <clears throat> kind of in terms of budget okay. effect. I don't I don't think it's great, but it's that's how you know the levies built is based on the budget. Russell, do we have a, a do you have do you have an org chart for the engineering road and bridge department? That'd be helpful as well. Oh, a what, Jay? Org chart? An, an organ, organizational chart. Oh. So an org chart just showing the positions, and particularly if you're creating kind of a, a newer position related to a management, just uh, how that lays out, who reports to who, uh, the number of individuals, and, and what their names or titles are. Okay. And Jay, this is uh, Kevin. Our, uh, our department has been working on a countywide org chart, and uh, I'll get with Russell to give him some of our data so you can pull that together. Excellent. Thank you. And then you're going to go out. Is this a posted position? You're going to go out for a search? Uh, the intent, my intent would be to hire internally. I think you'll have current applications from folks. Yeah. From, to promote within. Internally. And then. Someone with the knowledge of the county and, and our work experience, um, I think, would be a crucial aspect of this position. Great. Is that, are we, Jay, what do you think about that? Going to a management position, should there be a need? And Gary McAndrew is here as well. Maybe he can kind of speak to that. Again, I'm not trying to do delay, but it's going to be a management position. It's not a, a hire from within, within the union contract. So is that something we should, should we be doing some kind of a, a posting, a search? I believe you would have to still post it for- For veterans, like, right. Well, it, it, you know, it just brings up more issues for me that, you know, and so we're, you know, we're, we're a little shorthanded, but my first thought would be, okay, what's in the union contract? Can we just eliminate a position? That sounds like what we're doing. Um, so that would be my first thought is to go to the contract and see what that says, make sure that we're, we're okay there. Um, if that does allow it, now you're just talking about, uh, you know, creating the position, the documents we're talking about and the wage increase. Um, you know, promoting someone specifically from within uh, happens quite often in the private sector um, where the job's not posted, but a little less in the public sector. So, you know, I would be interested in, in having uh, the job posted and we go through an interview process um, that makes sure you get the right candidate and that the individual that's in that position knows that they, they earned it and it wasn't just a, you know, internal uh, nod to somebody who's been there for a while. Gary, did you want to come up to the oh. podium? And then Jay will be able to hear you as well from the podium. Good morning. Uh, I, I was working with Russell. Russell reached out. And so we were working on the job descriptions and things. And 
and we realized going from a union to a non-union uh, so, you know, so we looked into, I know he has the documentation, but I actually t talked to Pat Esch uh, just to get his feedback. Russell uh, suggested I do that. And it was, it was his opinion that he felt the um, people, he, whoever the next person was, that managing the, the, the people in the union would be much easier if they were a non-union employee because he ran into some issues about having people maybe cooperate a little bit, as, as Harley kind of alluded to. And so that's that was the the purpose or the intent was to take it to a management position. It was hoping that the subordinates, whoever this person is managing, will will listen to them anyway. And uh, I know Russell does have documents as far as a union to a non-union that that may be an issue, but we we do have some paperwork that says that that, that is possible to do it. It appears anyway. So, but but you do bring up a good a good point. There might be some push back a little bit from the union, but I think it it definitely helps the case or the, when the outgoing person is saying that, and he's a union person, that he's recommending it not be a union person. So to me, that that spoke very highly of what Russell's trying to do. I did read chapter 20, um, is the public employee relations chapter. Um, and uh, section 20.4, the exclusion section, said the following public employees shall be excluded from the provisions of this chapter. And it talks about a supervisory employee. And some of the duties that are relevant would be assigning, um, disciplining, and res responsibility to direct them. And it, it says other things too, but I was just trying to be on topic. Right. And I think a little bit of maybe the, the kind of awkwardness right now is that in previous time, our HR director, Don Sherman, would be sitting where you are, Gary, right now, and your presentation, Russell, would be very limited. It would be, it would be the HR director presenting the need, explaining the situation, how it relates with the union. So all of that is to come. So um, I think there's likely consensus that this is a good change, and it it really helps your management team kind of fall into place with your administrative team. But getting the right documents together isn't a reflection on you. It's just the unmet questions that we have. I don't know how you feel about us possibly going forward next week if you're not here, Supervisor Pato. Well, I think he's gonna to have to uh, talk with the union just to make sure they're not gonna want. That's position replaced you're taking a, a member away from them and putting it on management i don't want to you coming back in two weeks saying now you want a, a crew chief also you know what i'm saying so you're taking one person away from that was your superintendent i understand that but he didn't have any supervisory powers but we get that person. I don't want you coming back, you know, in a month or so saying you want to fill Pat's position also. Yeah, I guess, you know, at a high level, what I'm having trouble with uh, Russell and the board is you're in it's different times, I know, but you're you're losing a senior person. And many times in organizations, when a senior person retires, you replace them at that wage level or lower just because of seniority and experience, that's what you're paying for. In this case, we're changing that and replacing with a $10,000 increase. And so is that justified? So well, that would be at the end of five years, Jay, with the wage scale. So depending upon where you start, where they would start. Well, that's what I need to know, Russell. So day one, what is the increase? If it's zero, I'm getting much more comfortable. If it's 10 grand, I'm... I'm probably need a little more work. I mean, it's possible if you bring someone in at, at step one, there's even a small budget savings compared to you gave us the wage that the current employees are 2884, step one's 2738. So, right. Um, and I think what would shed more light on it is the opportunity to evaluate with comparable counties. I think you'll realize that. Um, Dubuque County is mid-level when it comes to 
maintenance uh, and general roadway budget performed with the miles associated with the budget were mid-level in the charts and but our wage scale is the lowest so i'd like to see that I, data I, I understand your concern please, please please share that data with us that's important yes. it's been yep. that data has been used and that argument's been used multiple times successfully for those advocating for those wage increases but i, I need to see that yeah, so I think I think it'll shed more light. I understand your concern, but if, if we're gonna do this, I just wanted to do it in the most proper way. And um, comparing counties is the only way I can view this as a justification. And I think the numbers will will show that. So I'll I'll, I'll definitely send that and and any other feedback. Um, on, but just that's where that's where it came from. It just didn't come out of the blue. Of course. Um, and I agree. I don't think this individual, if in, if hired internally, would start at step five. It wouldn't be that. Um, Starting at step one would be a wage increase for the majority of them, correct? Right. And it depends depend on the individual we get and, and their experience. Um, it could be, yeah, most likely it would be one of the lower levels, but working yeah. their way up. I'm not opposed to this. I think all of the, the issues that have been raised, it needs to go back to, I think it, I'm not ready to take action today, but I think with Gary's help in putting some things together about the other search, you know, the other counties' wages, all of that I think should come to us in some kind of format. We can have that for us to make the decision. We'll have to go. I, I think it probably should go out to be posted and accept the applications. You can have a, you know, a week search. Mm -hmm. um, when is Pat done? First of November. Yep. Yeah. So there's a little, there's some time here. Not much. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was, you know, it was, it was some time for Pat to train. Yeah. I think that would be crucial. And then also with the, you never know what the end of um, October, you know, right. early November can bring as far as snow, but we are planning snow routes. Uh, October 5th is our meeting. Yep. Can I have this employee for a good long time? So mm -hmm. that's right. Yep. yep. And Do then you, you can. Any thoughts? No, I just think more of the conversation we've had and some of the, the documents and data that uh, we've talked about if we can get that into the into the record next week we can have a little more robust conversation on it or and or make decisions but i'm, I'm not ready back today so i'm back to supervisor Pata. you'll have to you know i don't know what to do next week because your seat will be empty and you won't be able to be on the board right I and i'm not be on the meeting at all but uh I, if you're comfortable with the information, I'm I'm supportive of the movement. So if you're if you my colleagues are satisfied with the uh, paperwork that uh, Russ brings forward next week, forward with it. Work for you, Russ. Absolutely. Okay. All right, that will uh, take care of the work session then. Oh, we have one more issue on the, I know we're out of time, yeah. but um, this Schuler Heights Road, is that a separate, it is a separate work session. Excellent, thank you. Okay. I'll call the uh, Board of Supervisors in the session for the nine o'clock meeting, Tuesday, September 6, 2022. We'll start the uh, meeting with public comments. At this time, anyone may address the board on matters of which are on the agenda. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Individuals wishing to comment on a public hearing will be given the opportunity during that respective hearing. Individual remarks are limited to three minutes. 
Do we have anyone in chambers wishing to address the board? Mr. Kirkendall. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Richard. My name is Richard Kirkendall. I'm from 1725 Alta Place in Dubuque. I, uh, I'm here to address the board on an agenda item, uh, which was a letter from the county attorney, CJ May. I just have a few brief comments to make about that. Um, first of all, as the letter appears to be some sort of advice or reprimand to the board that you need to conduct your business in closed session and not talk about it publicly. That's not actually what the code requires. The code allows the board to go into closed session and keep things from public view, but uh, the board, the, the law explicitly allows the board to talk about anything it wants to in public session and it, it encourages it. And that's for a good reason because Iowa law encourages transparency and sunshine. Um, the code does provide that a governmental official who has a conflict of interest in a matter for discussion at a closed session should recuse himself or be re excluded from the meeting uh, by the governmental body. Uh, and so Supervisor McDonough was absolutely correct last week to question whether Mr. May should have been part of those discussions in the closed session that the board held last week. Uh, from the beginning, the county attorney has been directly involved in the allegations against me, not as a supervisor, not as an employer, but as a participant, as a witness, and as someone directly involved. Uh, he has a conflict of interest visible from space in that matter. Uh, it's big enough to drive a truck through, pick your metaphor, whatever it is, he's got that conflict. So you cannot say, as a member of this board, uh, that you want to limit liability for the county and then in the same breath say, you're comfortable with Mr. May providing legal advice on these matters. That's simply not compatible. Every time you involve him in discussions involving either Ms. Newsom or me, uh, you open the spigot for further liability for the county. That has to be obvious to you. Uh, Mr. May's letter, again, appears to be an attempt to continue to hide his involvement from public scrutiny. That is the opposite of good government. Sunshine is the only answer. And if the county attorney will not recuse himself from these matters, you need to do it for him. Uh, if you continue to allow him to meddle in matters of his own creation, you will have to answer to the taxpayers of this county as to why you allowed it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Do we have anyone else that would like to address the board and chambers? Seeing no one else in chambers, do we have anyone online wishing to address the board? We do not. Okay. Move on to proclamations. We have no proclamations for approval at this meeting. Uh, we'll move to the approval of the minutes of the meeting of August 29th. Motion to approve as presented. I will second that. We have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as presented. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we'll go to the consent items. We have a public notice, uh, chapter one zoning ordinance amendments, which this has started quite some time ago, and this is just the final uh, approval on this. Yes, good morning, this is uh, Kevin. This is the final public notice uh, for the chapter one zoning uh, amendments that were put through last December. Uh, our office has assembled the entire zoning ordinance and then it has been reviewed by the zoning department um, and the final step here is publishing it in the paper and then it will be effective uh, start of business tomorrow so it'll be up on our website and any new changes will be in effect and enforced uh, tomorrow morning any questions okay I'll make a motion to approve the consent items as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent items as presented. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, I just want to take a quick moment to thank Tammy, Henry, uh, Amy, and Lindsay over at Zoning and the Zoning Commission for all their uh, work on this ordinance. And we will continue to uh, look forward in uh, amending it where we need to. Thank you, Kevin. Next, we go to procurement procedures. We have none for this meeting, uh, no public hearings. We have no plats for approval, uh, action items. 
have a resolution to approve the hiring of deputies, assistants, and clerks. I believe there's just one position that is being filled at Sunnycrest. Motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the hiring of deputies, assistants, and clerks. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the purchase of service swap contract for Dubuque County Fair Association. The amount of $100,000 from the ERP funds. Ed. I'm, I'm here, and if you have any questions about this, I included a memo that provides an outline of, I think, where we are going and a brief synopsis of uh, each of the three um, projects that are on the agenda for your consideration this morning. The fair association is $100,000. I thought I heard you say $400,000. 100,000 for the fair. Okay. He, he I said 100. He said 100. Sorry. Okay. For the ballroom roof replacement. I'll make a motion to approve the Dubuque County Fair Association resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the purchase of service swap contract for Dubuque County Fair Association. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution approval of the purchase of service swap contract for Dubuque Food Pantry. That is for one hundred and seventy-five thousand. The uh, new building, I believe, they had purchased also one hundred seventy-five thousand. Yep, expansion of the Dubuque Food Pantry. Anyone have questions for Ed regarding this? I'll make a motion to approve the Dubuque Food Pantry for $175,000. Second. I have a motion, a second to approve the purchase of service swap contract for Dubuque Food Pantry in the amount of $175,000. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution for the approval of the purchase service swap contract for operation and power. That is in the amount of 291000 That's to assist with the uh, Liberty Recovery and Training Center. If there's no questions or uh, conversation, I will make a motion to approve the Liberty Recovery and Trading Center for $291,500. I will second. I would just note that the um, project detail continues to expand and change, which was a concern that I had. When we had them here and discussed this amount, um, so uh, I'm voting no on this. I have a motion and a second to approve the purchase of service swap contract for operation and power liberty recovery and training center not to exceed 291,500. All in favor signify by aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Nay. Motion carries. Next, we have a au resolution authorizing Dubuque County representative to the Regional Governing Board of the Mental Health Disability Services of the ECR. I just want to read that resolution. <clears throat> Sorry. So it's, it's approving the signature to the 28E agreement, correct? It's not appointing someone to the board. I am appointed to the board. Correct. The <clears throat> resolution authorizes you to sign uh, Chair McDonough on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. So we're going to have a work session, <clears throat> and that's a part of the subject. Is it part of the subject of the work session? We have uh, CEO May Hinchin here. Is that what we're going to be talking about uh, in the work session? Not to my knowledge. Okay. So there was a memo in the file about the 28E agreement. Um, I guess to my colleagues, do we have other questions about the 2080 agreement or the process? Um, I'll wait for that um, before I make my motion to approve this resolution. 
Okay, we can hold this until we get to the other issues with the East Central Region, if that's... Yeah, I'm not suggesting we need to do that because it's two separate issues, apparently. The 28E was... Like there's three separate discussion. issues. Yeah. So do you want to table this to the end for the, for all I, of that? That's what I'm asking you. If you I don't believe this needs to be tabled, but my colleagues had questions about the 28E agreement, which is why it was brought back to us in this format. The memo and so forth. I mean, the purpose of the work session is not to deal with this uh, agenda item, this action item here on the rest, right. for the resolution. And uh, it's my understanding that the 2080 has been signed and approved by every other county in the region. Uh, this is, for all intents and purposes, a formality as Correct. far as getting the signature going. I'll make a motion to approve the 20, to approve the resolution. I will second that. A motion a second to approve the resolution. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve and appoint a designee to the Deferred Compensation Program. And uh, this is a administrative clerical resolution in nature. Uh, the county needs to have a administrator on record for the Deferred Compensation Program uh, in the absence of an HR director. Uh, that will be me. Uh, I will be working closely with the Human Resources Department, um, and uh, this will not, uh, should not take up too much of any of my time, so. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution as presented. Second. I have a motion, a second to approve and appoint uh, Kevin Degado as the designee for the Deferred Compensation Program. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Thank you, Kevin. Next, the resolution to approve necessary documents for Chicks Fry Excavating, uh, Dubuque, Iowa, for the purchase of a 2009 Ford F750 Super Duty bucket truck, amount of $84,900. I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution uh, to purchase the 2009 Ford F750 Super Duty bucket truck. Mostly because I want to. I will second that super duty bucket truck motion. I have a motion, a second to approve the purchase from Chick Fry Excavating, the 2009 Ford F 750 Super Duty bucket truck. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the first amended and restated grant agreement under the fiscal year. 2019 Build Transportation Grants Program for the Northwest Arterial John Deere Road Cor Corridor Build Grant. I believe what this is doing is putting $600,000 more into that uh, fund from the federal government into that build grant to cover additional cost. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to approve the first amended and restated grant agreement. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next, we have a resolution to approve the extension of task force grant number 19, heroin 02. And that is. $3,000 addition to that grant for total funding of up to 17,000 from 14,000. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution for the heroin test force grant. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the extension of task force grant number 19-heroin-02. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Next we go to communications. Uh, more manure management plan. Rolling acres. Uh, the crop rotation was changed. Chair, 
Do you want to take those individually? Pardon? I did you want to take those individually? I I'll make a motion to receive and file without taking action on the three articles of communication as listed in our agenda. And do that. I'll I'll second the receive and file motion. Okay, we have a motion to receive and file all three communications, which are the manure management plan petition in support of paving Christoph Road and the Butte County Attorney letter to the Butte County Board of Supervisors. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Next, we have appointments before open vacancies or information only. A question, are we expecting next week to do appointments for Board of Health? We will likely move that to the 19th, when we'll have all three supervisors here so we can have the robust discussion. Is there any other position that you think we're going to appoint to? Have we gotten other applications or is it just Board of Health? We have other applications. Uh, I will be putting that information together with our staff. So we were doing that quarterly? Correct. And is this a quarter point? I'll have to look back and see what the what the times we were using for each quarter. If it happens to line up where September is generally the time we would do it, then yeah, we'll knock them all out in one fell swoop. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, move on to personnel. Motion to approve the personnel requisition for permanent part-time Cordell security. Deputy Ray Nix has moved uh, on. Yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the personnel requisition. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the personnel requisition for permanent part time courthouse security. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Uh, go to the motion to approve the personnel requisition for the permanent full time assistant roads maintenance supervisor. With that, we are going to take table till next week. The board can take no action if they choose. I believe that. We want to do public comments at this time. Anyone may address the board on matters of which are of concern to that person and which are not agenda items. Please go to the podium, state your name and home address. Please be aware that the board is limited in their ability to respond to such inquiries and I will code privilege the board from deliberating or acting on items not appearing on the agenda. Individual remarks are limited to three minutes. Do we have anyone in chambers wishing to address the board? Do we have anyone online wishing to address the board? Do not, we do not. Okay, our next work session will be at 9.30. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn or recess till 9.30. Motion to recess until 9.30. I will second that. I have a motion and a second to recess till 9.30. All in favor signify by aye. 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 We'll return at 9.30.
call the board supervisors back into session. We'll move on to our 930 work session. Uh, discussion and possible action regarding Dubuque County Courthouse, Dubuque County Sheriff's Office, video court system. Nathan. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, Nathan Gilmore, IT Director for Dubuque County. Um, the video court system, it, it's important to delineate that there's the video court system and then there's Zoom court, which they have been doing for two plus years now. We are specifically talking about the video court system that is currently in operation between the DLEC and courtroom three in this courthouse. Zoom court will play a role, but we are focusing today on that piece of infrastructure. About a year ago, I submitted several ARPA applications. One of those was to replace this system um, in conjunction with the DLEC team and the county sheriff and county attorney and public defenders. Um, that time has come. Um, the system is incredibly old. It is well past end of life. We need to replace it with a modern system. One of these times, the DLEC team is not going to be able to repair it. And there's no one we can call in Dubuque. Everyone who was involved with it has long since retired. Um, it's, it's that old. So the system is incredibly important to operations, to the DLEC, to the courts. It's used hours upon hours every day for efficiencies, for security, reduce COVID spread. We need to replace it. Um, at the end of the day, technology has evolved. So the system that we put in today would be more advanced, but also simpler at the same time. Um, we put a lot of fiber in between the courthouse and the DLEC about a year and a half ago. Some of that was put in place with the idea that we're gonna start using some of it for this. So we have good connections between the buildings ready to go. We just need to design it and get it installed as quickly as we can. Courtroom three is scheduled to have the same AV upgrades as the other rooms this November, December. That has been bid, purchased. The equipment is a supply chain issue. We're not gonna get the final pieces until late October. Ideally, we would marry these projects and do it as one large, take the room down at one time um, if we can get approval to move forward with this. The other stakeholders are in the room. Um, it, it, we're all in this together. We're all in agreement. We need to replace it. We would request to move forward um, immediately. And this, uh, this work session is with possible action and there is a resolution attached as well. So uh, good morning, everybody, and um, thanks to Nathan for the for the intro. Um, he's better at uh, talking about the technology piece than I am. So, um, but uh, the courtroom in question is the one that we do all of our initial appearances on. Uh, without this uh, system, we personally have to bring each individual over here to the courthouse, which provide uh, which creates a substantial security risk for our employees, for the, uh, for the defendants and, and everybody else involved. Um, for the last couple of months, we've kind of been band-aiding our current system together. Jay's done a, a, a very good job of uh, keeping things up and running as much as possible, but there's been mornings where uh, the judges have had to do Zoom court. Um, and just so you're aware, Zoom court uh, is pretty much done from the, uh, the chambers uh, judges chambers and it does not allow for accessibility to the public which is a violation of state law and so um, days where we days where we um, are not able to use the video court system and we are uh, we are not allowing public access to the to those court hearings so um, it's one of those uh there are exceptions uh, because of you know 
technology um, problems, but uh, um, unfortunately we can't just go to uh, a, a point where the judge just goes from his chambers. They have to be in an open courtroom. And, um, and so we wanna make sure that we keep that accessible. The sheriff's office, since the start of COVID, uh, we have currently three Zoom setups, uh, one in each of our visiting rooms and one in, um, in the North Jail. And as far as our side is concerned, uh, it's, it's gonna take very little to, um, that really needs to be done on our side. We've got the connections, we've got the access. Uh, I think about the only thing that we've talked about on our side is a hard line uh, telephone uh, over here that the defense attorneys can use to talk to the, the clients uh, that isn't monitored. As you know, all of our jail phone calls are uh, recorded. So this, this uh, phone system will be outside of that, not recorded. Um, but other than that, uh, I mean, we've got everything we need on our end. Uh, most of what needs to be done needs to be done in the courtrooms and just making the connections. So, um, but it is something that's that's getting to the point of desperation, and uh, we need to get that. Uh, we need to get these this uh, patchwork system uh, out of the rotation, if possible. Any questions, Anne? Well, I would just share that I practiced law at a time when folks came across the street in shackles and did their initial appearances. I mean, I, so when you were describing that, I think um, the email that we received, I'm drawing a blank here. Yes, from Shane accurately describes, I think, what the experience was before, and we're not going back to that time. And my questions are going to relate to budget. You're using words like desperate situation. I don't understand why we're using uh, ARPA dollars for that, for that circumstance when it should be in the budget. So, you know, we'll hear from the county attorney, but th those are my questions. Like courtroom three clearly made it into the budget. What's that cost? Why isn't this in the budget? and not part of the federal plans. If there's room in the budget to do this, I think this is something we should move on quickly through that process. I just have a couple of quick comments. I, I you know, um, according to the rules, every defendant is entitled to see or must see a magistrate within 24 hours of their arrest. Uh, so every person that's been arrested since the court the day before is seen at eight, in 8.30 video court. Uh, those arrested on out-of-county warrants, out-of-state warrants, those folks are seen. If they reset it for a couple of days to sort something out, they're seen again at 8.30. So this system is integral to the process of, you know, criminal court every single day. It really is. Um, so uh, I think we, yeah, we need to uh, make this a priority. Um, I, I was just asking Nathan about the court, the video part of this and whether that had been included. <clears throat> Excuse me. Apparently, it had not, but um, it, it is it, it is clearly something we have to get taken care of. We've been struggling the last few weeks here. It went down. Jay went back and was able to kind of get it back running. But this, I think, every day something is probably going to happen, or everybody is on pins and needles that either the video part's not going to work, the audio part will vice versa. You know, it's just, it, it's sort of a mad rush anyway. Um, we get the information into my office. We prepare the, the list of who will be seen every morning and that goes to the judges. The public defender goes back to the jail um, and we have it, of course. And that's what drives the whole system through that video court. Um, uh, and yeah, I, we certainly don't want to go back to bringing people back over here and and doing it that way. So um, whatever we can do here today to move this forward, I think it's really imperative that we do that um, by whatever source of the funds. I I don't, There's just to be clear, there were no funds in my budget uh, for this. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, CJ. The uh, issue with the security and prisoners, obviously have been there very well aware of it, uh, bringing that many people across the road and trying to watch them when you're in the courthouse here. And it takes a lot of manpower. A little confused, Nathan, on your tenure because uh, 
first uh, memo. Yeah. So as 50,000, yeah. and then you go to 184,000. That's where I'm confused at. Uh, Auditor Dragago um, created the resolution and inserted it to try to get ahead of this. Um, what my ask, our ask for today is 50,000. And 50, if we need 50,000, um, the original ARPA proposal had it broken apart into chunks. And that's what I'm chunking out is the, the video court component of this. Some of that ARPA proposal was put into my regular 55 budget. So we can certainly come back with the resolution, which is what I said we were going to do for what we are asking for today. Um, if it what you be, need for the video system, then it's 50,000. Correct. Yeah, I am confident that we can get both sides of the street ship shape in a sustainable solution for that amount. Would that money be available in budget, Stella, or? Budget agenda or amendment, I guess. Sure, we can put that in the budget amendment. 50,000 is, is doable, more easily doable than the larger numbers. I mean, I'll just say I'm not really concerned where the money's, what bucket it'll pull from. I mean, ARPA, whether it's general, my goal is to get approval to get this done. I think it's something that should be in the general budget. So anyway, Andy, you got a question? Well, I wanted to know about the courtroom three, which I know, again, was in your original ARPA request. That $60,000 is for courtroom three, and that's in the budget right now, correct? Yeah, when I did the January budgets, I had a line in there that was the remainder for what I needed. So that is done. That The ARPA proposal was done nine months or so before that budget was done. So courtroom three is in, will be in good shape. It's just video court is not part of that project. anyone talking about the other remaining two pieces of the ARPA request? $50,000 for courtrooms remote court and the law library needing $24,000 for the law library. Are those, I understand that, I don't know if you're talking about those things today or we're not going there. Is it, are you coming back for that? Is it still a high need? It, so the, the law library is in the budget and CJ and I have worked on draft plans to do that and that's in progress when i did the arpa proposal it was the idea was well you could use arpa funds if you didn't want to pull down general funds my goal today and i believe everyone's goal here is the crisis that the urgent need is video court i am happy to come back and talk about the other nine or ten arpa proposals and the other pieces of this I think I would speak for everyone. We really just want to get clarity and consensus to move forward with the video court replacement today, which would be the 50,000. Jay, do you have any questions? Uh, no, no questions, just a, a comment that uh, seems to be a you know core need. And if it's used on a daily or very frequent basis for both the county attorney's office uh, and our sheriff's department and the whole judicial system. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter for it and uh, I'm willing to take uh, our budget director's recommendation on where those funds come from. So um, I'm comfortable taking action uh, today. Thank you, Jay. Anything further? Ian? No, I'm comfortable. Certainly it needs to be done. Auditor Dragago, do we need to come back with a resolution next week with the right number or could we amend what you created if this is not going to be uh under arpa and it sounds like it's not then the resolution will not apply um and uh the budget director prepares her budget amendment it will be included at that point uh if the board uh, is in consensus they can give you authorization just verbally today to start moving forward that works for us if that's the consensus i'm comfortable with that I am as well. Me too. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I would obviously. I know this is the first time we've talked about it in this detail, but if there are other things 
that you need that are in this category of desperate, needed every day, piecing things together, like a freight elevator, stuff like that. I would like to know about that, okay? Our next work session is scheduled for 10 a.m. Motion to recess until 10 a.m. I will second that. I have a motion to second to recess till 10 a.m. All in favor signify by aye. 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 We are in recess until 10. I will be leaving you, Chair Potoff, uh, so I'll be heading on to my other duties here in San Diego. So okay. proceed without me. Thank you, Jack. You bet. Bye-bye.
call the Board of Supervisors back into session for our 10 o'clock work session with the County Engineer and County Sheriff regarding Schuler Heights Road Traffic Study. Joe and then Russell, what do you got? Good morning. Um, I passed for the traffic study that was performed by Schneider. Um, just kind of wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, just kind of present information from this. Um, I did have the opportunity to discuss um, some of these uh, possible implementations um, with the state. And um, if we can kind of just, I guess I'll just go through that first. Um, on page six, um, one of the potential improvements would be the R38 sign, the inter intersection lane control sign. Um, that's one that the state um, agreed with and um, possibly moving forward. Another one on page seven, the, um, the W2-2 intersection warning sign for Schuler Heights. Um, that's one that they were in agreement with. Um, there was a tourist, same page, tourist orient, oriented directional sign. Um, that's something that Cypress would have to apply for. Um, and we did not discuss this with Cypress yet. Um, actually, um, when I, I spoke to Cypress um, I think Wednesday or Thursday afternoon, um, and I did mention to them about this sign, they were well aware of that. Apparently they have applied for it in the past. And that's what they explained to me uh, during the conversation. And they were denied because they're a seasonal business. Um, however, um, our thought was that given the fact that the state has done this study and this is the recommendation that they should probably reapply um, because now we have this to say, hey, you know, your your own study said that we need this. Um, it should give them some ammunition to be able to, to um, get approved for that sign. But again, it's up to the state whether or not. Right, maybe we can send a letter of support. Something. You yeah, know, from yeah. the county as well. Certainly, and that, you know, we can we support it as well. And we, there's nothing we can do to make it happen other than be supportive, right? So, so though that was pretty much, um, in summary of the discussion I had with the state, and uh, I believe we have the privilege of Anthony Barjet with Iowa DOT. If Anthony wants to provide any comment to that. Um, but other than that, um, so um, I'm looking here at the item number four, the following recommendations. I don't know what page you were on. I printed it from the packet, so I'm not sure what page it is, but they list A through F as um, recommendations. And uh, the Zypers haven't seen this report yet, right? I mean, they didn't have it. No, I, I called them um, last week, uh, understanding that it was last minute, and uh, invited them to the work session today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think Shella had to run the, the store, and Steve, I believe, uh, is full-time employed with it at, at another uh, business in town and uh, was not probably going to be able to get off work. I would like to get this report to them and... Russell, I don't know if you can visit with them, you know, meet them and kind of discuss. I had a, a brief conversation with Mr. Zyper myself and after I think he had, you'd spoken to, I think to his wife. Yes. And he's interested in obviously seeing the report and then lear learning what their conclusion is to how to, to be better and, and to be safer. That's been their position since the beginning. They've been, I think, a very... Uh, they want to be in partnership with us and have the best uh, and safest orchard and fall business that they can. So, um, In addition to the report, uh, we received uh, an email last week um, from the Attorney General's office. And so just a reminder to the board, last fall, Anthony and I came to the board. Uh, the recommendation from the state at that time was for the county to enact a uh, no parking ordinance in that area and it would it was on it was the onus of the county to make sure that that happened 
Um, after some discussion with the AG's office, uh, they just uh, right. Thursday or Friday uh, sent us an email saying that uh, actually the state can uh, put no parking signs up there. Um, um, basically, all they need is a request from the county sheriff, uh, which certainly I'll be willing to send in um, and try to get that as a no parking section. Um, and then at that point, then our deputies and then the state patrol could go out and enforce uh, anybody who is parking in that area. Um, um, so uh, part of the issue that we have right now with people parking there is uh, it's more of a policy issue with the sheriff's office. Any other vehicle that's parked alongside the road, uh, we don't we don't ticket and tow them automatically. Uh, they're always given 72 hours of, uh, of notice before they have to move the vehicle. Um, so for us to go out and even though the law says we can um, ticket those vehicles immediately, it's, it's not our standard practice. And I don't think it's a good precedent for us to, to set that we're gonna start ticketing and towing every vehicle that's parked alongside one of our highways. Um, it's because this is a short-term pro uh, problem that affects us all year round. Um, but if the, um, if the area is specifically marked as no parking, that changes that situation because now it's a no parking zone and, uh, and we, can, we can ticket and have moved vehicles that are there. This is the, the conversation that I really wish to have with Mr. Zyper present. Because when we talked about the no parking last year, he had, um, he was, I think, a very good participant in that conversation. He has some real reservations about what that might also cause with safety implications. So, um, you know, in my conversation with him, that's kind of what I told him is I'd like to have any further discussion be when he is available. And he's entering into his busy season. You know, they've now been open now for two weekends. So I think get him the report. Maybe, you know, Sheriff Kennedy, you can have that updated conversation about the attorney general um, and have that in a way that's, you know, neighbor to neighbor. So, so that we're just sharing the information before we start making, you know, the hard conclusions. I want him to be part of this. He's shown that his great interest in doing that and has led on this. So, you know, I'd like to know if he's using some of the things that are mentioned, even as recommendations, he might be able to do some of these easily. Is he using the parking attendant this year, like they do at the, the pumpkin patch right out there? Yeah, I'm not sure. My understanding is, and um, I don't know, was it you that said he'd put a larger parking sign? Somebody told me that last week that he had just put a larger parking sign um, out in his yard and they have um, increased the amount of parking that's available on site. Um, so, I mean, I think they're, they're working on things on their hat on their um, part of this to try to uh, make it safer. But um, I don't, the problem with the parking alongside the road is that once one person does it, that's, I mean, they're you know, they're, they're all going to do it. They're going to be like, oh, this is where we park. And so, um, so the biggest thing is trying to get those cars directed off the side of the road and onto the Zypers property. And I know he's, uh, he said they've had like a flag person in the back in the past trying to get people in and it's still, people still park on the side of the road. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm I 100% agree. I think we should have them involved in the conversation. Um, my only concern would be, um, you know, with um, supply chain issues and things. If we if we want to start like getting in contact with people and getting signs and things ordered, um, they have a very small window that they're open. And essentially, if we start doing that now. Right. We're, pro we're probably already behind the eight ball and probably aren't going to get any signage posted before this season is even right. up. I was just going to bring that up that we knew this was a problem last year and now we're addressing it, finally getting it addressed this year and it's in season again. So right. 
there's really not much we're going to be able to do for this season. Right. But, there, but we weren't in charge of this timeline either. We right. I understand that. Early. I yeah. understand that. I mean, this report's dated August 9th, and, and here we are. I mean, it's dated August 9th. You probably got it, you know, snail mail, and it came. But all the same, here we here we are. He's open now for two weeks. They've been open two weeks, and there's great recommendations. And so let's share it with them and start down the path of they're going to probably choose some of these recommendations themselves. Um, and if we can get that, yeah. Um, I don't know if there's something you think we can do still this year, Sheriff Kennedy. Again, we want to have the Zypers with us to do that. Right. But is there some something that seems obvious that we should still be able to do this year to make change? You know, the only thing that we can probably do this, could do this year, but we have, uh, uh, Russell and I both have serious reservations uh, against doing that, would be um, to put the dynamic message board signs up. Um, the problem with that is if you do that once for them, then every little festival that pops up has a right to have those signs. And we really can't say no to some other festival at that point. And then we're going to be running around every, or County Roads is going to be running around every Friday, setting up dynamic message board signs and picking them up every Monday. Um, I don't think that that's probably the best use of their equipment or time. And so um, I, I would strongly recommend against uh, putting up message board signs for that reason. And we can put where we have message boards to do so. I agree um, wholeheartedly with Sheriff Kennedy. Um, however, our dynamic message boards are not properly equipped to be placed on the right of way of a highway. Um, but there is an alternative option and we can do dynamic message signs state and but that obviously comes with the cost and I have um, data for that, but it, it'll more or less, you know, for two units for approximately a two month duration comes to be around $5,000. So. So when do we want to get back together and talk about this with Mr. Zyper, with his family? I guess that's really up to them. Uh, I mean, we have regular meetings and um, you know, I guess it's when he, he can be him or a family member can be available for one of the regular meetings. Right. Well, I was glad to get it in the agenda packet, right? But that's my first awareness of this as well. So I had nothing to share with him. He called me to find out what was going on and reported that you, you know, made an initial contact. So let's, I mean, and I'm happy to be part of the let's, let us, I'm happy to be part of that, go out and give this to them and start the conversation with updated information and work toward the solution and he'll know the time pattern and we know what our possible choices are uh, i'm delighted to get the report there's some recommendations that's a whole lot more than i thought we might have from the state report i mean i think um i think that's a that's a good idea um uh, as far as what we're going to do this year um unfortunately i think probably the only alternative we have right now is to um just Ask, you know, we'll give our, we'll have our deputies give extra enforcement, especially on their festival weekends. We'll contact the state patrol um, about doing extra enforcement down there and, and try to keep the speed down. Um, and, you know, hopefully that, that'll be sufficient to uh, keep any problems from, from coming up this, this year. And, um, but yeah, I mean, we said last year at this time that you know, we needed to work on this and get ready. And unfortunately, um, you know, we didn't get, study. yeah. And yeah, the problem was, you know, we, we did get the study uh, right away, but it was, that was major league baseball week, which obviously, oh, right. you know, we had many other things that we had going on and did not have time to. And he's been open and, for a couple of weeks yeah. and this landing on his desk, we, we're not in charge of that time. We have the information. That's a great, a great step forward. Um, there's some things here about pavement markings and signs that the state could post. Russell, did you explore that with the state? Yes. Yeah. We'll do some of those things or not? Yep. You know, um, I kind of mentioned before the two signs 
that they're willing to furnish as part of this study. Um, I don't, that was just original overview discussion of this report. Um, as I mentioned, it was that W, uh, R3. R38 intersection lane control um, sign. Uh, don't recall them complementing that with pavement markings. Um, and as well as the W2-2 intersection warning sign. They're willing to do that as well? They're willing to do it. I don't have a timeline on that, but that was just their initial take from our brief over, you know, general overview of this traffic study that I had with, with Iowa. Well, the biggest concern was people on the highway. So Schuler Heights is obviously the biggest concern. People parking along Schuler Heights and trying to cross the three or four lanes, three lanes, I guess. On anything on Schuler Heights at all or well, oh you mean people parking on Schuler Heights? I don't know that that's actually been much of an issue as much as people parking on the highway or on the gravel on the shoulder of the highway. Uh, I thought they were parking on Jeweler Heights also. Yeah, that. Oh, and then yeah. across the highway. I I don't. But if people park along Jeweler Heights, that's something that we can do something about right. because they can. There's no shoulder. They'll have to be on right. the traveled portion of the roadway, and then we can and do enforcement on that. Uh, but I don't know that that's ever been a problem because um, one of the other solutions that. Zypers had was um, Schuster's, um, I think the same people that own the pumpkin patch on, on Schiller Heights Road, um, they own, I believe that farm property right on the um, southwest corner of Schiller Heights 52. And whoever, whoever that was, I'm pretty sure it was Schuster's. Um, they had told Zypers that if you know, people wanted to park on their on their farm property that they could, which is great, gets cars off the highway, but then people still have to walk across the highway. So it it solves one problem, but creates another problem or more of the same problem. So, um, so that was not um, gonna be a good option either. Okay. I guess my action plan would be to share this with, the business owner and the landowner and right. point I'm glad to have it. we know there's little to nothing we're going to be able to do this year forward into next year would be the oh we got the study back we got some options that and and just to work with Schuler's excuse me the Zypers to see what we can do this year right yeah you've described some things Joe that we'll do the best we can with yeah and I think um Ultimately, the goal is probably going to end up being um, to finalize our plan in the next couple of months and get it implemented over the winter so that we're ready to go. And, you know, we're not remember talking about what we're going to do with this intersection. I think, I think he told me he buttons up. Um, yeah. All life stops. Two weeks in two right. Weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's really about two or three weekends where it's really a problem. Um, That's and, weekend. Yeah. And the rest of the time, you know, it's just kind of a minor headache. You know what I mean? So I was reading through that report. Uh, it really, I mean, there's been some accidents, but not. At an alarming rate, which kind of surprised me to a certain extent. Yeah, no, and, and fortunately we haven't had any really bad accidents. Um, but um, you know, I think I told you when Anthony and I were out there last fall, two people we we were standing in the driveway for probably 20 minutes talking while we were there, two separate cars uh were southbound and they were in the outside lane and got to Zyper's driveway. They both turned in the driveway, which was great, except they did it from the outside lane. So they crossed the other southbound lane of traffic and then they crossed the northbound lane. It's like how they didn't get cremated doing that, pulling that move, I don't know, but, uh, but two cars did it in 20 minutes. 
Viper told me there was a recent crash out there. I don't know. There might be, might have been a recent accident, but nothing with significant injuries or anything like that. And unfortunately, we have enough accidents that we cover that unless they have like significant injury, they don't really come to the top of my head. <laughs> I guess the, the point I make about that is that that crash data continues to build. And some of the some of the information in the report admits that they couldn't do <clears throat> traffic count number accurately because of COVID. So they were going back to some data from 2017, and they think that the time frame of during active COVID, because traffic was so de depressed because of people staying home, you they don't have the information to draw necessarily some of the trend lines. So well, I thought that was interesting. Also, you you might not be able to fully evaluate the increase in traffic because yes. this hundred hour study was done out of season. There might be a, a fluctuate of traffic in season. Study did not encompass. Great. So you get into the fall of the year, there's a lot more traffic, people going beef, look beef runs and stuff like that. Yeah. So the number does increase. I think the speed also decreases at that time of the year because more people are cluttering the roadway looking at leaves. Locking each other up. Yep. I appreciate your both of you continuing to keep attention on this issue. Well, hopefully we'll someday we'll have a solution. So <laughs> oh, we got some recommendations. Like That's a big step forward. Mr. Zipers has expanded his lot and from that report uh, the lot has not been full you know i think it's getting people to understand that there is a lot of parking there to pull in you just talked to me about uh, different options where we might be able to do another driveway cut which probably whether that helps or hurts but i mean they're very flexible and looking for the solutions as well I think the problem with adding another driveway for them is, I mean, they're right on a curve. So wherever you put another driveway, it's going to be on a curve, you know, so. It, I guess I go behind, you know, on the property line, kind of behind the orchard, it'd be past the corner somewhat. Maybe, I don't know how far the property line goes up. Right. It's pretty contained and that part of the land around them is, I don't know if the estate's closed or not, but there was an estate. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Thanks, Russell. Motion to recess. I will second. The motion to second to recess till 1030. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 You're in recess until 10.30.
for those waiting on Zoom, we are uh, waiting for our uh, participant for our next work session. So we'll be checking in in just a couple minutes. Call the Board of Supervisors back in the session for our final work session of the day. We have a work session with the East Central Region regarding replacement of the County Disability Service Coordinator. May. More conversational? Oh, no, friends and family at this point. And Jay is not with us. Oh, he's not. He's gone now. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm triple booked this morning. So <laughs> there's been a lot of running back and forth. All right, so um, we'd just like to have a conversation. I'm not near ready to do a personnel requisition, um, but to ha just have a conversation with you about replacing the coordinator of disability services in Dubuque County. I wanna back it up just a little bit. The Iowa code has some requirements about staffing, regional structure and staffing. And it's really interesting because as I was digging into this a little bit over the weekend, the Iowa Code used to say that there was a coordinator of disability services assigned to every county within a region. Some regions don't have a coordinator of disability services for every single county. They have maybe one who's assigned to two counties or three counties, and this is more of the rural regions. The update in the code, and I've got 331, which is the home rule, 331, 390, which kind of establishes regions. And then I have, um, that's the Iowa code, Iowa administrative code, 441-25.12, parent 331. That's the regional governance structure. Both of them say, updated code says, there's one or more coordinators of disability services. It doesn't say anymore that there has to be one assigned to every county. And I thought that was really interesting, but had the discussion um, with our board chair, as well as our administrative staff, because we are the largest region in the state, we feel like there's still a need to have a coordinator of disability services assigned to every county. I mean, it, the code no longer requires that, but we think it's necessary because of the size of our region and certainly by the fact of the size of Dubuque County. So certainly we want to move forward with replacing um, the coordinator of disability services in Dubuque County. I pulled up our policy. We have a policy, a regional policy about what do we do in the absence of a coordinator? If someone leaves, retires, whatever. And the policy says that I should offer that role to the current coordinators. So every coordinator in the region has a role to the region. The 2080 agreement that you approved this morning says for their role to the region, they're accountable to the CEO and to the regional governing board. For their role to the county, they're accountable to the board of supervisors. So that means in some counties, they have general assistance or veterans affairs, substance use disorder assigned to them. That percent of whatever that is, the coordinators are accountable to the board of supervisors. Their role to the region, they're accountable to the CEO and to the regional governing board. So by policy, I have to offer the role that's open, which is contracting to the other coordinators. And if anyone wants it, then we have a discussion. We talk about the feasibility of that person taking that on. Our policy also says, which was very coincidental and timely, that in September of every year, we should reevaluate the needs for coordinators of disability services in the region. So last Thursday, which was September 1st, it was very timely, uh, <laughs> when we had our, our monthly administrative team meeting, we did that. We looked at what do we have for coordinators, what makes the most sense, what makes the most efficiency. The code does say that we should use staff efficiently. So um, long discussion. We ended up with a decision amongst the administrative team that we would combine 
a current role, which is provider relations and contracting. So provider relations has traditionally um, met with the providers and given them support, talked with providers about developing new services and making sure that those services were ready to go. And then provider relations has handed that over to contracting to finalize it up with the paperwork, right? And get the contract signed. So <laughs> for efficiency reasons, we have decided we'd like to combine provider relations and contracting together. So then we are like, okay, now we have an open position. So through discussion, we have decided, and we will be writing a job description for approval by the regional governing board, um, that we're gonna have a new coordinator role called access coordinator. We have a very specific goal in our regional strategic plan about access to services. And that is everything in the strategic plan from geographical distribution, transportation, the amount of providers that are available. So the access coordinator, we would like to be responsible for monitoring crisis services and access to crisis services. We have enough anecdotes that crisis services are not timely enough. And so we want to make sure that we have somebody who's working with our crisis providers to make sure that they have the capacity to meet the standards in the law about how soon crisis services should be available. Um, so crisis services and a lot of our justice involved services, we are growing in justice involved services. <laughs> we have the law enforcement liaisons. We have one here in Dubuque County. We have um, EIT training offered. You know, we have a contract with Solution Point to do at least two trainings in our region a year. Um, we have the jail social workers, which we also have here in Dubuque County. And I'm missing one. Jail version, the biggest one. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a, about a $750,000 contract a year with the Department of Justice, Department of Corrections um, for jail diversion in our region. So the access coordinator will ensure monitoring of that service as well as outreach to healthcare. So in our strategic plan, we have three very specific population groups law enforcement and justice services, healthcare and education. The coordinator team felt like we have um, education really well covered. We have a children's um, coordinator of disability services, plus we have the children's navigator who's, whose primary job it is to develop relationships with school districts. So we're like, okay, we've got, we've got school districts covered, but we really need to make sure that we have this connection with law enforcement and with healthcare. Um, the access coordinator will also help to um, brainstorm, you know, vision and development of new services with me and help to make that become a reality. So we will be proposing to the regional governing board that we combine provider relations and contracting and develop this role as access coordinator. So now that's all timelines. <laughs> so we have our operations meeting, our operations committee meets next week. We'll develop that um, job description, take that to the regional governing board for approval at the, um, at the end, September 22nd, I believe is the regional governing board meeting date. And then once it's approved, now we have a new role. I have to offer it to the, to the current coordinators to see if somebody wants to step into that role. What I'm getting to is we want to uh, replace the Dubuque County Coordinator of Disability Services, but I'm not exactly sure quite yet what that role will be. It used to be contracting because when Jody was here and Jody had just naturally stepped into contracting, when Jody retired, I opened it up. Does anyone else want contracting? Everybody was like, no, we're happy with our roles. And so contracting became the role of the Dubuque County Coordinator again. I don't know for sure that the access coordinator will be what we offer as the coordinator of disability services for Dubuque County. So first of all, just thoughts on that feedback. Obviously there are some issues with the last job description and stuff. I'm not, in favor of the county having any percentage of the employee. Obviously, the way the last one ended, the county had no recourse. So, we're going to be the fiscal agent. We're going to be the fiscal agent basically for the ECR. And, you know, I understand 
you're a county employee, but technically you're a county employee because we're the fiscal agent. We're paying your wages, ECRs, reimbursing us. So that's where I'm at with it. Uh, I just, it puts the county at risk for losing money. And that's what happened this last time. And I, I'm not in favor of it, I'm sorry. I think, I mean, that's, that's Harley, I appreciate that, that input. And that's very um, business and from a practical standpoint, I think philosophically and, and Supervisor McDonough, you can agree or disagree, had for a short period of time, 20% for substance use disorder. There's a great need for coordination of substance use disorder in Dubuque County and all the counties. But I almost think that we're not there yet. I mean, we're, we're keeping an eye on it. You know, we have the, the uh, integration of the Department of Human Services and the Department of Public Health. There's a lot of language circulating about co-occurring disorders. From the East Central Region, we have a priority to advocate for the blending of funding between mental health, disability services, and substance use disorder, because we know that those go hand in hand so often. I, I feel like there's a time and a place, but maybe we're not there yet, which would agree with your statement about not wanting to have any percent be assigned right, to the I, county. For that 20%, I'm not sure where we're going to get that from. I guess I just don't want it to be this percentage of an employee because it just clouds up the whole employment process. I don't know if it's something that our jail social worker can handle and you're paying for half of that we're paying yeah, for half yeah, yeah. and one of the reasons that we're paying for half is because we can't pay for substance use stuff right now and so it's like okay the county funds are paying for that so it you know i know we're just getting that person on board so we got to see how that plays out a little bit too I, th those are the things i mean it's like we're still building a foundation that i'm just not sure that we're ready yet to say there's administration Right, and the setup responsibilities there, defined. The setup there with the fifty-fifty is different than Point very. the setup <laughs> yes. with the ECR. Yeah. Nothing against the ECR, yeah. but that person is actually under the direction of a county yes. supervisor, where yes, you're not. You know, that's what yep. Yep. that's what makes the problem. Uh, and so there is a there is a very high need in Dubuque County to have coordination of resources and services in our county to address substance use disorder. That is very real. And I, this is an Ann McDonough comment. It is not being addressed. What do we do about that? The players and the resource providers and the funding for that, not the county, but in our community is changing and evolving. And so when I'm on those meetings and listening to that work, we're still trying to identify who's going to be in the room. So there's a new provider, um, ASAC, and they're here, and but they don't actually, they're, the person doing the granting, the work here is out of Clinton County primarily. So what's being done in Dubuque for substance use disorder is still an unknown. We could benefit from some education from the community partners about that issue. That is not the region's work other than how you're looking at it, we are together through some targeted investigations, right? Wanting to get there. <laughs> we will get there, but the community itself is in, is in process about that, okay? So the regional work that we're doing that our new coordinator of disability services will be performing, what that work will be is still being identified obviously through the employment process that the region employs those policies, but also we're completing years of extended services, new services at the region that I think are very beneficial to our community. Now is the time the regional boards decided to reflect upon where are the gaps, start to collect the data, see what's happening, see what's working and see what's still missing. And that's why I kind of think the access coordinator is going to be a great role. I agree with that tipping my hand, I guess, as a regional board member. I think that's a great new position. 
what Dubuque's role will be for that person, I don't know what it will be. It would, they're all very rich positions and they will bring great benefit to us. So well, I have no, there. no doubt about that. Yeah. I'm just concerned with that 80-20 split that that's where but Harley, we just did that last year during budget, right? Yeah. To say right. who could lead on that. And the reality is the county can't lead on that. Right. And and in the community, who's leading on that? That's the conversation that I keep asking. Who's leading on that? Who's leading on that? And the partners continue to come in and out of these groups and it's changing. So we we do need to explore that conversation, but that's not a regional conversation. Yeah. So when we're ready to do that, if that becomes this board's priority. That's through the supplemental budget. I just don't know when we'll be ready to do that either. We kind of need to have a strong partner because we're not opening the substance use disorder employment position here. Right. right. So, um, I, I mean, I, I like the way forward. Other things that my, my most immediate concern, honestly, is the Disabilities Council is without a direct regional support person. And they are doing amazing work and they're causing ripples throughout the community, the region and the state with some of the views that they're challenging us with the data. So how do we address that? Because I do think co-occurring brain health, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, they have uncovered something that we could do better at. And I think that there's another, I'm not gonna call it a disability, but the issues that seniors face I'm not calling a disability because I don't think that it is, and also because I'm 60 now, so I don't think <laughs> that it is a disability at all. But that hasn't been explored. Who is, what's our role and the regional role in the brain health issues of seniors experiencing extraordinary isolation? And and what's the, are there gaps there? I think in our community there are, but we just can't get it all done in May and in one year, right? biggest issue with the disabilities is transportation. Holidays, there's no transportation. Sundays is limited. Yeah. yeah. And we have a, um, a study that the University of Iowa is doing on behalf of the region, um, looking at the barriers and gaps and obstacles on transportation. And we will have, it's taking a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but we will have the recommendations by that committee by the end of this calendar year for changes that we can make in order to and address some of those transportation barriers. It's a very expensive topic to address. I mean, it's you're gonna pay somebody for eight hours a day well, to transport and you may only have two transports. That makes those transports pretty expensive. But sure. we want we want disabled or elderly to have the ability to get out when they need to get out. I yeah. think when we see how we compare to the other part of the region, I mean, just even in the regional governing board meeting where we started addressing transportation and there was an initial report from the University of Iowa, you could start to see things that Lynn County was doing or the city of Cedar Rapids was doing. You could start to see how some of those pieces maybe would translate here. So that transportation barrier, we all face it. Mm -hmm. But when you start to look, what's really wonderful about the region is we get a chance to see what our other colleagues are doing and, and solutions come up. And, you know, it's not any different than the Cypher situation. There's nothing here that's all run, but working on those pieces to find the solutions, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Just do better. And I think we can do that. Back to your comment about the Disabilities Council, Supervisor McDonough. Um, I'm willing to provide what support I can until we have a new coordinator here in Dubuque, if they'll have me. I think they have a meeting next week that I've got on my calendar that I would like to attend. Um, and if they have me, then I will provide support. Uh, well, I think they'd be until, delighted until we have. Until yeah, we I'm, uh, I'm putting the agenda together. I've spoken with a couple members of the council. And uh, so we're gonna come up with a rough uh, agenda today and tomorrow. I'll uh, reach out to you at some point. We can maybe get a little work session with you. Um, one of the suggestions we are going to make is that we they actually elect a chair and a 
co-chair at this point. They've had about a year to settle down, and, and I think they're ready for that. And, and in conversations with the Disabilities Council, uh, they agree. So we're going to try to get some administrative work done on this meeting in lieu of being able to sort of tackle some of the, the other things that, that need to be done. And one of the things I would ask the council, their minutes should be shared. Oh, right. re regardless of what happens, uh, this process is going to follow the same process as the Board of Supervisors. So meetings will be scheduled through Civic, which is our in-house software that we use. And then minutes will be published. Everything will be treated the same way as it is. With the I, Board I understand of that. Meeting. But they are asking, rightly so, for stronger direct connection. They have been here three or four times before the board. So not just publishing, but even sending with an email from the chair to May, to myself, they've already uh, I, I reached out to me separately, Kevin, to say, when's the next meeting? How do we get the agenda of the regional governing board? Well, that'll be, I mean, that'll be a duty for the chair and the co-chair right. on that board. So once they can, once they elect who they want to be, who they want to have to be the chair, then we can have those conversations with the chair as far as what has been ex expressed to us, as far as what is uh, required and requested. Um, I think though, what we're hearing is the CEO of the region saying at the local level, she's more than willing to work with that local board and looks and hopefully it fits everybody's schedule. I know you try to accommodate me the second Tuesday of the month. So it doesn't, I appreciate the auditor stepping forth to say that you'll facilitate that for the time being, but um, the information that they are preparing goes right alongside with what we're doing at the region. Yeah, so I'll help. Perfect. As long as they'll have me. Um, back to, and I also want to talk about job description. I've told the operations committee this. They said we're meeting next week. We have regional roles, and in some cases, people have county roles. But in every case, we're all employees of our own county. And I don't want to, I don't want to step on any county as far as if in job descriptions they have listed hours expected to work, or in job descriptions, if it has a policy about holidays, you know, paid holidays, that type of thing. So I'm almost envisioning that there's a double role. There's a because every county has the authority, not just fiscal agent, but for Department of Labor issues and you know the disciplinary issues as far as Department of Labor, those types of things. Counties have those responsibilities, and I don't want to step on that. Some counties in our region have unions. I don't want to step on that either. So I kind of envision that there's a, a local county job description and a regional job description to say, you have to abide by Department of Labor laws with your county, who's your employer of record, but here are your responsibilities for your role to the region. Right, but I would have to guess that moving down the road a few years that the east central region is going to have to become the, the employer, employer. Record. you're right. working yeah. for them you yeah. know you're not tied to the county other than whatever you know 50 50 for the social worker right, right. something to that effect but um and you know we've had that discussion there's too many rejected. different there's yeah. too many different aspects this way every county's got different contracts it's not fair to the person that works here and doesn't get the same benefits there well i don't want to keep taking on more employees because our benefits are better or something to that effect you know we have more paid holidays than what they have also it's like well i, I just want to be a Dubuque county employee well, i don't think that's ever been the case but um the like job description the job description was created um, by HR back in a time when the transition from a retirement of a long serving director it hadn't been updated. I don't know. It had, yes, yeah. exactly. So I think that the region preparing the job description as to what this new position will be, whatever that role is, I think that that is exactly what we need to rely on the region to do. Hopefully this all happens at the same time that we get a new HR director, because however that interplay is between our basic county policies, I do see that that would be an attachment A or a supplement to, I don't know, you know, you'll have to step through that what it looks like, but it will be a complete role that is subject to um, the regional reimbursement. 
have another part time position for that person to fill. And I think Supervisor Padov, to your point, there's always rumors about what's going to happen in our system, you know, and and the the Department of Health and Human Services has been very very clear many times that they're not interested in taking over our system. That doesn't mean that they don't expect some changes in the next couple of years. So I, there's currently even just some beginning rumblings about taking us out of Iowa Code 331, which removes home rule because now there's no local funding. And so home rule is less applicable. So certainly there are changes. And so we might see the evolution of employment through the region in the next few years. I think there has to be changes because I, mean, I can envision some counties saying, well, we don't want, we don't want any employees involved with this, you know, that is what we say. That's not <laughs> I'm just what saying, you know, all of a sudden, said. all the employees are belonging from the nine county region. All the employees are belonging to one county. Is what one region? Or did. simplify everything. You know, okay, they're only paying Dubuque County for everybody instead of right. paying every other county. Well, not interested in that either. Sorry. So the one region who did that put out an RFP, and only one county submitted a proposal so they have a big changeover in personnel too um at the county the county directors or coordinators had kind of changed as well yes because um some of their counties changed right lost and gained some counties so they had their whole kind of structure changed so it kind of seems like the the ability to change the structure there existed because there were so many other changes already underway. Yes, so many other it made variables. sense. We're in a very stable region with the highest population with long term serve board members who've served a long time. So and long term staff, you know, and that's when it, there's an, there's another region who previous to this year um, pulled everybody in under one county but it was the retirement of the CEO. So it was a new CEO and then it was all new staff. It's a very small region, but I think all staff but one were brand new. So it was easy for them to write policies about sick time or, or um, vacation time, that sort of thing. We have eight of 10 administrative staff, I'm sorry, seven of 10 administrative staff have worked for their county for more than 20 years. And so we have people who have like different longevity and different seniority, if there's a union issue, um, as well as accrued vacation time, accrued sick time, that it would be just a little bit more cumbersome. And that was one of the things that we considered at the regional governing board level is like, should we do this? Well, we've got a lot of long term staff and that that will be a big issue about does then the region pay out? vacation time or sick time, what rolls over, how do we decide that, you know, the, those were amongst the discussions. I really appreciate you being here, May, and being here to assure us it's top priority and what the region looks like as of September 1st with the various procedures to look at who's going to do what kind of work and what's needed, what the gaps are. So timeline, if the regional governing board approves this concept, um, September 22nd, then I have to open it up to current coordinators and I'm blanking on the policy. It's either two or three weeks that I allow. So I'm really looking at probably not beginning um, coming to you with the personnel requisition until mid-October. So just wondering how you feel about that. Does that feel okay to you? I think that's pretty aggressive timeline, but sure. Yeah, I know too. I mean, like we want to keep in mind of where you're at with the HR director position and having somebody on board. Certainly we would want to be, you know, in step with that. I have excellent, excellent HR assistance right now. I'm going to keep you informed of where we're at and know that we're moving forward, but there are certain processes that need to happen first. Let's see how this is. Um, oh, it's just replacement. I was just going to um, just ask about our fund balance projects. 
you know, the $1.3 million that we put out into the community. Accounting for that, who's collecting that information. So that we can report back to citizens, you know, all the really truly great work that our partners have done. Um, I'm preparing a report for the regional governing board for September, but that's region wide. I understand if you want, and I'm happy to facilitate that we get a more um, detailed <laughs> Dubuque County report. And I can have, I can have Shelly and, and Winter work on that, reaching out to each other. I mean, I know where they're all at as far as like how much they've submitted for reimbursement, but maybe more detail as far as like, what we do with it? How many people did we impact? Right, yeah. What, what do we learn from it? Where do we see further need? If you would like a report like that, I certainly can have people work on that. I know we're more than 90% expended. We had a deadline of July 31st. But that has to be out, that had to be spent already. Right? It did. Um, we can still accept claims right. and accrue back, right? But they had to provide all the services by June 30th. Um, we had a deadline of July 31st for all providers to get their invoices in. Um, they all didn't make that date. And we you know, made a real conscious decision that we didn't want to be hard nosed about that because we wanted to get the money out there. <laughs> and so we, we, we gave a little bit of wiggle room. And so I think we're done as far as like claims coming in now. Um, I know our claim staff has been real on top of it and reaching out to providers like, hey, the deadline's passed. Do you have any trailing invoices so that we can make sure it's all accounted for those fund balance projects? Given accounting every month. Yes. It's there from the finance folks about how the money's being spent. But I really am talking about the actual information, like the senior study, and I want to see what the conclusions were. So we get our own we have a story to share, but we also are enriched by the work that's been done. That's what I'm anxious to see. I do know that the um, psychogeriatric study that was facilitated and, and led by Hillcrest and Finley, um, Mike Fidgen has been in contact with me that they're planning to provide a report. It ended June 30th and they're compiling the report and, they, and he told me September. So sometime this month, we'll expect to see that on your agenda. But I'd like to also put a report together for you that has them all kind of in one spot. Good. Thank you, May. Great rest of your day. Everything for the agenda? I will second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Aye.